Hey everyone, it's Matt Pinfield. Thanks so much for hanging out after the stream and that great show from Daughtry. I'm hanging out with Chris right now. We're in Nashville. Chris, it's so good to see you, hey, man. man. It's so good to see you. It's been, what, two years? Yeah, two years ago we were backstage. Uh, Bush and Live. Bush and Live and Our Lady Peace. You were there with Shavel from System of a Down. Yeah, yeah. And I ran into you there. I was like, what's going on? And it was great because we hadn't seen each other in I know, a while. It's been a long time. But, uh, I hardly ever, I hardly recognize you. You lost so much weight at the time. Yeah, which is good. <laughs> it's a good thing, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, absolutely. Worked super hard on it during this pandemic, too. Yeah. And speaking of which, I mean, you know, one of the things that I loved about tonight's show that I always enjoy about seeing you live is your ability. I mean, you're just incredible control over your voice, Chris, that you've always had. But the fact that you can emote so well, there's there's an emotion that comes out when you perform live. I had to ask you, during the pandemic, since you, it was probably the longest time you haven't been on the road, yeah. um, what were you doing to keep your voice in good shape during that thing? I mean, were you just, I know, besides writing? Uh, honestly, um, I, <laughs> like, uh, like a lot of people, uh, I struggled big time when the, when the pandemic hit. As a matter of fact, I, like the first, I don't know, six weeks, I just had a huge identity crisis. Like I hadn't, like you said, I hadn't been home that long in 15 years, 14 years at that time. Um, and I didn't know how to be present as a husband, as a father. And uh, it was always like, I got a couple weeks at home and then shit's getting hard, time to hit the road again. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I was kind of really forced to, um, really look at myself a lot. It was a lot of introspection that happened over the past year. Uh, but, you know, it started with, uh, hey, how are we going to get through this? Day drinking. All right. Pick a pack of cigarettes. All right. <laughs> let's let's get through this. It's it's Corona time, man. It's pandemic, you know? And then it turned into like an everyday thing. And I, I finally like woke up one day and I was like, I got to stop this shit. I got, I, got, I got a record to make. I got a voice to keep. I got a, um, you know, I... I Dove headfirst into the gym, um, and you know had to replace bad habits with good ones. You know, and uh, in the before the pandemic, we were we were working on the record, and then once it hit, it was uh, you know nobody wanted to get in the room with anybody, rightfully so. You know, everybody was scared to death, didn't know what to think. Nobody had ever experienced anything like this, so um, we had a few songs written, but. Um, you know, World on Fire was one of the last songs that was written right before everything hit. And um, at the time, Australia was burning and there was, you know, no shortage of police brutality even then. I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, the Breonna Taylor uh, situation happened and everything we looked at, I remember being in the studio and it just felt like the world was on fire. You know, it was just like everything you look at is is wrong. Everything sucks. Everything is you couldn't help but not, you know, you couldn't help but feel that, that worldly pain. And uh, I remember saying the world is on fire and, and Scott and Marty, who, who's producing the record, Scott, Scott Stevens from the Exes and Marty Fredrickson, um, who have worked with both of these guys for a long time and uh, have so much respect for, they were like, that's, there's a song title. And we were scrolling through, um, these uh, folders uh, that Scott had compiled like before the session, like just my little song starts. And I remember seeing this folder that said fresh as fuck. And I was like, ooh, what's that one? And it was the ding. And we were like, that's sick. And we just started writing the song. But I still haven't answered your question about how I kept my voice in shape. Um, I think getting back in the studio just kind of, um, kind of just, you know, when you, you don't use it, you lose it. And, uh, I went for weeks not needing it and months even and uh, had to kind of get myself back into it. The gym helped. The gym helped a lot. Yeah, the exercise thing is amazing, right? I mean, But it's know. a daily thing. Sometimes I don't even know why it's not working. And then some days I'm like, I don't know why it's working so great. It's, it's like... A, yeah, it, it's different than being the guitar player. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's an incredible responsibility to be the front yeah. man in a band. You know, speaking of World on Fire, you know, it, we, we talk about the fact that you had had it really written before yeah. the whole pandemic. It was a perfect song for that period of time. I know that, you know, on KLOS, where I work in Los Angeles, at the radio station there. Super uh, grateful for it. Thank we you. played the song 
a lot. We played the hell out of the song and uh, and loved the track, yeah. and it just sounded so great on the air. And it, sound, it was a perfect song for uh, for everything that was going on. You know, it's so weird. Like um, we wrote that in January, and then fast forward to uh, when everything, you know, when shit hit the fan and everyone was home, and Scott calls me. He's like, "Dude, do you realize we like we kind of like." wrote the future <laughs> like we weren't really thinking about it when we wrote the song the sickness is rising um you know the the you know then you know george floyd happened and it was just like oh my god these lyrics are like it gave us all chills and we were like we kind of can't release it right now it, it feels like it would be too like on the nose it would fe it would feel like it was too opportunistic um and we, we kind of held off a little bit. And at the time, the band hadn't even performed on it. And we were like, I don't even know if we're going to be able to get back in the studio. So we, uh, we had everybody cut their individual spots at home. And it just worked out. We don't love doing that. We love being in the studio together. We love being in the room and kind of feeding off that energy, just like we love being in, in, you know, in, a, in a crowd and feeding off that energy. Um, but it turned out so much better than we all anticipated and we were like this has to be the first single like it just makes sense feels right you know it's amazing it's going to be album number six that went quickly didn't it man? oh my god it went so fast you know <laughs> I mean, it, and it's a new uh, new chapter for you too yeah. because this is the first record that you're going to do uh independently you know because you yeah. did those for many years through rca and bmg um and one of the things that i know that you're excited about is really taking complete control over your own a and r basically yeah. you know which is your song selections um and you know just everything about the record you know yeah. uh, and it's amazing because you know i've gotten to hear some of the roughs and it, it's there's amazing songs and there's some really heavy Thank songs so but the people that love like the songs that and things they followed you for from the very beginning there's something for everybody there which yeah, i think is yeah. so good you know i, I know your fans are going to love this record Thank i you. mean and you've already got this idea of sequencing and everything so i think people are going to be super satisfied when they hear the record for you what was was it a, a freeing experience to take this all on your own now and say all right i'm going to do this yeah you know um you know we we've been on a bit of a musical journey you know, through these five records that we released. And um, I've always gravitated more towards the rock side of things. And, and you know, you start to have these hot AC hits and these, these uh, you know, these songs that, that get really successful and then people start kind of leaning like, oh, this is where we need to lean more. You know, And when you have people that are, quote unquote, in your corner or have your back, and they start saying, we kind of need to be focusing more on this side of things. And you think they, you know, you, you want to listen because they're, they're your team. They're your, um, and, I'm, and this is by no means throwing anybody under the bus. It's the nature of um, seeing the change of, of radio, seeing the landscape of things change right before your eyes and, and see bands that you loved not playing guitars anymore. And then you're like, oh, maybe I should be doing this too. And um, you start to kind of feed into that a little bit. And fast forward to when we did Baptize, well, when I did Baptize, because the band wasn't even involved. It was just me and uh, Martin Johnson who produced the record. It was a time when, you know, bands like myself weren't on top 40 anymore. And we were like, how do we, you know, you start chasing, you start chasing that, that, you know, success. What does that even look like? You know, you're like, I, I gotta, I gotta do what these guys are doing, or I gotta do what these guys are doing. And, and you start, the things that people start telling you start getting in your head and you start believing it yourself. And then fast forward and go, when, when, you know, we parted ways with RCA, I was like, what do I want to do? Like, I don't want any input. I don't want anyone telling me the, the producer I want to, I need to work with. I don't want anyone telling me you need to go back to the way Leave This Town sounded, or you need to do another record like Break the Spell, or you need to do like your first record. I didn't want to hear any of that shit. I wanted to, like, what do I want to do? Who do I want to work with? Who are the producers and writers that I've worked with over the past few years that I feel like get me and what I really bring to the table and, and me as an artist, me as a human being, me as a performer? 
And the first two guys that came to mind was Scott Stevens and Marty Fredrickson. And we, and I was like, hey guys, um, I want you to, to produce the record with me. I want you, us to write the songs together. I want to produce the album together. I don't want a bunch of outside co-writes. I don't want, um, you know, if it's not guys in my band or, or us in the room together, uh, there's actually a song on the record that, that uh, I wrote with my wife. Uh, if it's not in this circle, I don't want it. And I, and I was, it's the first time maybe other than I'm trying to, maybe the first record where there was nobody from outside that circle going, hey, this song right here is going to be a hit. You need to cut this song, you know? And you can believe in a record all day long, but the second someone does that and it's not a song you believe in, it taints the record for you. And this is the first time that that has not happened from top to bottom. And it is the most liberating feeling. I feel like it's the most conscious album that I've ever created. It's, I feel like it's the first time I've actually had a solid vision from top to bottom of what I want the record to be, what I want the videos to be, what I want to fucking wear in the video. What, and I don't have anybody saying, mm, that's not going to translate well. That's not going to... That's not going to make it to, I don't care. I don't care where it lands. I just want it to land. And I want it to be, I want everyone to know that it's authentic top to bottom. And they're either going to love it or they're going to like it or they're not. But they're going to know that it was 100% from my heart and soul. Yeah, it completely represents you and, and how, you know, every, what you want to do. And I think it's great. There's, you played one of the other new tracks, which is going to come out next week on the 19th. Yeah. Heavy is the Crown, which is another great song, and it really does showcase your incredible vocals. Thank you so much. Tell me about that song and the message behind it. That was a, that was a song um, that Elvio Fernandez, our keyboard player, um, he had this idea, sent in uh, first verse and chorus. Uh, it was like, hey, what do you think of this? I think he was really, um, uh, like many people, were really affected by um, when Kobe Bryant, that tragic unexpected accident that happened um it it kind of i think informed his inspiration for the song at how um you know nobody really knows the responsibility of of any given person you know everybody can look like they've got it great everybody can look from the outside and say well of course he's happy his life is great or we all have this heavy, heavy responsibility over our own castle, over our own world and our own family, our own circle. And um, that, that's, it's so easy for everyone to look at everyone else's and, and think they got it better or think that, that they're less significant than the next person. We're all as significant as it gets. You know, and we all have that responsibility for ourselves. And when you really see that you're responsible 100% for your life and your actions and your outcome and, and the, the, the vision that you want to see come to fruition, that's, that's heavy as fuck. That's a, that's a lot of weight on your shoulders, but it's also a liberating feeling to know that you are 100% in control of that. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the direction of where you're going you know, with everything right now in your life, with this record and everything else that you're doing. I mean, like you said, you got really healthy and you look great. Thank you so much. You know, it's a good it's a good time for that, right? I mean, it uh, is. It I is. Mean, I, uh... I like. I, I love that you did. You know, I've, I've got like ten months sober right now, and I feel really great. I Thank you. I'm all, I think I'm uh, on my third month now, which is amazing, yeah. and it feels so good. It's a good time. You I know? haven't had this clear of a of a head and probably as long as I've been on the road, 14, 15 years. Which is, which is incredible. Which has but, made me just so much like happier at home in general. <laughs> yeah. It's great. You know, tonight you did Man in the Box, and, uh, you know, we, we look back at some of the, uh, you know, the artists that, you know, we loved, that we were either friends with, we loved their music, and we've lost so many guys, like Delane Staley, so we lost Chris, you know, oh, and Scott, and, yeah. and all those people. All uh, hero just... I hold up here, you know, those were, everyone you just mentioned were some of the reasons that I'm up here doing this. Um, 
and such a, a huge loss. Um, I was very fortunate to meet everyone you mentioned. Other, I, I never got to mention. Um, I mean, I never got to meet uh, Lane or Cobain, but I got to uh, share the stage uh, with STP uh, before Scott passed, and it was one of their last shows with original lineup. And it was such a like uh, such a pinch me moment for us guys side stage watching him do his thing, and he was so in, such an incredible front man. And it's hard not to see that and want to emulate some of those you know antics on stage, and and uh, hence the the megaphone. You know, right. he was a huge influence in in that respect for me. And um, those records were transformative and 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 huge huge inspirations to me uh core purple uh dirt facelift those were like the records that that and um you know uh, and obviously live you know how much of a big live fan I, I am and those all were huge influences on me vocally musically um and you just um it's hard to know what kind of pain they must have been in you know yeah but the good news is i think you know the great thing is uh you, you know you know that they would want you to be doing really well and and you know i mean we're grateful to still be here and that's Absolutely. an incredible thing you know yeah. but they, they, like you said you've been inspired by so many things talk to me about those days as a young guy growing up in north carolina what were yeah. some of those records you mentioned all of those yeah. but what were some of the first things that made you want to sing what, what, what was talk to me about some of the first vocalists that you just blew you away and said i have to do this who were you emulating as a kid oh man um you know i i always kind of sang along to the radio uh and I remember always being a fan of, of, of pop songs growing up that because I, the melodies were so infectious. And I remember Rick Astley was like, you know, we've known each other for so long. Yeah. And I was so obsessed with that song. <laughs> yeah. But in my earlier teen years, my brother turned me on to the Black Album, Metallica Black Album. And I, uh, I didn't know, I didn't actually remember not realizing that metal could be so melodic and so, um, for lack of better terms, songwriter driven. And it felt like, like a whole new world opened up to me. And then he turned me on to Throwing Copper. Yeah. And I remember, and, and, and uh, Super Unknown, uh, Soundgarden, Super Unknown, those records, those three records were like the first introduction to me where I was like, I started getting the itch. I started like wanting to sing along to these records and I found myself wanting to know how they sounded this way. I found myself, want, and, and by, you know, by the way, I wasn't thinking of being a singer. I wasn't, I was a comic book artist. I wanted to, to be the next Jean-Claude Van Damme, you know. I, I, music was not a, even on my radar, but I found myself like wanting like to sound like that. Like if I'm going to be able to sing, I want to sound like that. And I remember singing along to those records, Super Unknown, um, Throwing Copper, uh, even, you know, um, the first Candlebox record and Tools, uh, um, um, Undertow. Undertow. Yeah. And, and I remember just like, ah, damn it, if I could only get that sound that he's getting, like, what is he doing with his throat? And, um, and I remember just one day something like clicked and I remember calling, um, I hadn't seen live yet. And I was so obsessed with Ed Kowalczyk's voice. And um, I called a radio station, this local station. I was living in Virginia at the time. I called this local radio station and uh, it was 106.5 The Buzz in uh, Richmond, Virginia. And they were on the Secret Samadhi tour. It was 97 and um, we, were, we were planning on going to see them in, in Richmond Amphitheater. And I was like, I'm going to call the radio station. I'd, at, at this time, I'd already learned a, few, a little bit on, on guitar and uh, had gotten the bug really bad. I was really wanting to be a singer or, or thought it would be cool to, to start a band. And I, um, and I called the radio station and said, hey, 
they answered. I was like, hey, this was back in the day when you would call and request songs and they would actually do it. And I called and was like, hey, man, um, if I sing like Ed Kowalczyk, can, uh, can I get tickets to the show? And they, they weren't having a contest. They, you know, this wasn't a thing. And he, I remember him going, oh, this is going to be good. Uh, hold on, let me stand by. We're going we're gonna to put you on. And I'm like, oh, shit. And uh, I went and got my guitar and I played Turn My Head. And they were like, uh, okay, uh, stand by. We're going to get you a couple tickets to the show. And then they played it on the air and we were all in the house like flipping out. Um, um, let's see if I can remember it. Uh, Turn my head. What was it? How's it go again? Anyway, it was like, uh, I can't forget you, but I can remember. You know, I was like, I was trying to like totally emulate Ed Kowalczyk in that. And, um, and it was, that was a cool moment. And then when I saw that show, I remember watching it um, as a, like a student. You know, I remember being super excited, but when the show hit, I, I didn't find myself w doing what everybody else was doing, like head banging and be in the show. I found myself like taking mental notes and I was watching every move he made, listening to his voice. And I just remember this feeling of, he sounds incredible. He sounds even better than the record. And I wanna do that. I want to do exactly what he's doing for the rest of my life. And that I went home that night and I never took it more seriously than that moment and uh and started writing songs and trying to emulate those records every chance I could and listening to what I loved about these songs and trying to figure out how to write my own versions of those songs, you know. Yeah, it's amazing, you know, cuz fast forward all those years and you're friends with all, All those guys are, friends, you know, yeah. with that, which is yeah. great, you know. And that's we, we and at there. the time, I had long, luscious locks. <laughs> Who knew that I was going to be shaving my head? <laughs> right, yeah. which is amazing. Yeah. You know, speaking of uh, of people that have inspired you and influenced you, uh, and you've done some incredible collaborations because people obviously love to work with you. Um, it's a two part question, actually. Um, what is one of your fav favorite collaborations that you've done already? And the second part of the question is, if there was someone that you could do out with or record with, and that means living or deceased, mm -hmm. who would that be? Oh, man, that's tough. Um, it could be more than one. One of my, one of my favorite collabs uh, to this day is um, with my dear brother, Lejean Witherspoon, Seven Dust. Um, we, did the, we did a song called The Past on, um, on uh, shit, I'm having a brain fart on the on the name of the record um i can't remember the name of the record off the top of my head but just i had always been a fan and then we did shows together and it was just like you said it's like these surreal moments where i'm like i'm fans now we're doing shows together now we're friends and it and and but getting to be in the booth with him and and just that dude's voice is raw power and and getting to uh you know, it, I'm not going to lie, getting the respect from those people, from, from those guys that I looked up to and look up to to this day is, is, is like one of, it's, it's one of the best feelings as an artist to have your heroes genuinely love what you do as well and, and give you all kinds of props. And uh, I remember even seeing the guys from Hell Yeah on stage. We were doing a show and, and it was such an intimidating bill because I'm like... You know, we're this rock band, but obviously with pop sensibility and you got these guys like Vinnie Paul on the side of the stage, like watching, but not watching and taking the piss out of you. They're watching like, yeah. And that's a, that's like the best feeling ever. Um, so working with Lejean, working with, um, uh, you know, Carlos Santana, even though we didn't even record it together in the room, that was such a surreal experience to be on his record and Slash, my God, I can't even forget to mention Slash on my first album. And he's pulling up to the studio playing on my record. Yeah. And he's, I'm like, hey, Mr. Slash, can I take your guitar? He's like, I got it, man. <laughs> and uh, I remember like, asking him like hey do you mind if um you mind if i stand in the control room 
with you while you're re- recording. He's like, dude, it's your record. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like Slash. Right? And I was just like, I, I, you know, I, you don't know what to expect. I don't know if you're just one of those cats that's like, I don't need anybody in the room when I'm doing this. And I just remember him, you know, cutting the record, you know, did a bunch of takes and was like, you guys can pick what you like. And it was so chill and laid back about it. Um, that was that was one of the first pinch me moments. Um, I was so green to making a record, you know, and now I'm making a record on a major label and Slash, you know, one of the greatest rock guitar players of my generation. Uh, that records that I listened to over and over and over as a kid, you know. Um, obviously appetite but the user illusion one and two records were like huge in my bedroom um loved those records so much and it was uh and then to be on tour with bon jovi it's like the it, the hits kept coming you know and it was something that uh i would have never imagined in a million years that was gonna happen it w- it was like one thing after another i didn't even get a chance to truly appreciate it because it all kept happening so fast and furious that I was just like, oh, here comes another thing. Oh, here's another thing. And I never really got to sit and enjoy it because it went on to the next thing, on to the next thing, on to the next thing. So um, t- that answers the collaborations question. Who would I have loved to collaborate with? Prince. Yeah. That, um, that would have been something that... Uh, I don't even know how I would have reacted if I got that opportunity. Yeah. yeah. And you know, he obviously knew who you were. I mean, he was... He I was, met him a couple times, and it was always, you know, it was very... I don't know if you ever met Prince, probably yeah. many times. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But it was very... Um, it was very... There wasn't a lot of conversation. He's very guarded. Very guarded guy. Yeah. Um, but I was honored enough to shake his hand a couple times and tell him how much he meant to me. Um but yeah, that that would have been that would have been something. His, in my opinion, one of the greatest rock vocalists oh, yeah. to ever step in front of a microphone. Yeah. The things that he could do, the, all the different colors of his voice, um, was. I listen to those records still, and I'm like, how the actual fuck did he do that after doing that and that? and then go into that part of his voice. It all was so effortless, and to be that much of a, an incredible musician on top of that, like I, I just don't ever want to pick up a guitar again, you know, <laughs> when, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm thinking of, of you know, greats like, like Prince, I, it makes me feel like that. <laughs> now, you know, he, he would have... Uh... He would have loved collaborating with you. I'm, I'm sure. I wish he wish he had le- lived a lot longer. But yeah. that's that's a great choice for that. Let's uh, before we wrap. Uh, let's talk about first of all. We want to clear up the rumors that have said the album is going to be called Nothing Lasts Forever. That's not true. Yeah, I don't even know where where that came from. I remember seeing the uh, the interview come out, and I was like, hmm, that just sounds like a version of a lyric from Backbone where it says, well, "It can't rain forever now." But I don't know where Nothing Lasts Forever came from. So. Um, um, that is not the album title. No. So no. for anyone who thought that that was it, I'm sorry. Um, if you thought it was a terrible album title, then you're welcome. <laughs> it's not the <laughs> album title. <laughs> well, and you know, I, like I said, I've heard a bunch of the tracks. They're so good. I know that your fans will f- all find something that they love on this record because it's re- there's, there's just so much to give there. And there's some incredible rock tracks too. So Thank it's you. like, uh, Thank you so much. You know, I know that I'm excited to be able to play. I'm excited to, crown. to see your face. I was excited to see your face and your response to a lot of these tracks. So that means uh, a lot to me. And it means a lot that you came out to do this. So, um, you know, I've always had a lot of respect for you, so thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Chris, and it's mutual, you know, ever since we met the first time, which is great, because we bonded over being these big music fans, rock fans, like you said, pop fans, because everybody starts by listening to pop or because that's what they, that's always a gateway. Say Paradise City is one of the greatest pop songs of all time. <laughs> yep, exactly. I mean, there's nothing better than melody in a song Absolutely. at the end of the day, right? So, but we love music, all kinds of music, yeah. which is so cool. So I'm excited about this uh this next record and once once again i want to tell everybody new single is out on the 19th heavy is the crown 
And all you rock stations should be jamming it. It's Absolutely. a great one. If we'll you're be... not, <laughs> we're going to come calling. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely be playing it on KLOS. We're very excited about it. I can't wait to if you're not playing it, I'll call and say, hey, if I sing like Echo Walchick, will you play my song? Yeah, that story is incredible, <laughs> by the way. I love that story. And I wish I could find a recording of that. I w hopefully someone hears this some this story and goes, we have that that on tape somewhere. That was back when, well, it should be on a CD. I don't know. Somebody's got it. Yeah, and before we wrap, what was his reaction when you told him that story the first time? Um, he thought it was incredible. He was, he was, he, he laughed, and uh, I wish I could have played it for him. You know, obviously that, that only adds more levity to the story but um yeah he he was honored uh, i remember the first time that um as a matter of fact how we actually met was i had done walk the line or hit their version of walk the line on idol and they cut that part out where i had said that and i'd gotten all this shit online everybody was like oh he ripped off live and didn't give him credit and i come meanwhile off, it just got edited it out got edited out and um that's tv and yeah of course <laughs> and I get off from I, I get off stage or or we were doing some rehearsal with Kenny Rogers of all people um, on the, one of the next episodes and I have a missed call and voicemail on my phone I didn't recognize the number and I listened to it and it was Ed and he was saying dude I saw it I loved it don't listen to the bullshit let's hang out and have a drink and he came to L A the next weekend and we hit it off and became best buds <laughs> that's that is such a great story yeah. it's amazing yeah. well i'll look forward to when we're out on the road again and yeah absolutely see you there but thanks so much for doing this for everybody thank and you and thank you all for for hanging out with us yeah absolutely yeah. guys so chris we'll head out now but thanks so yeah. much for doing that set it was great I got some more record to play for you later yeah i'm looking forward to it, <laughs> it sounds, awesome, man. stuff sounds great everybody thanks so much for spending time with us and checking out the live stream the guys were great tonight and uh we hope you guys stay safe and have a great rest of your week, and we'll see you soon. Thanks so much for tuning in for it.